Good morning and welcome to your daily game face. I'm Dr. Kim Lannon. and I'm here today after surviving the weekend of the 125th running of the Boston Marathon. <laughs> and in my case, it was 125th running of the first 16 miles of the marathon. And then my wheels came off my bus. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. Well, they came off my feet. Um, my feet get my it got very warm and um but it it doesn't matter because I still finished, which mm -hmm. is the goal. Yep. Um, but it got very warm very quickly at mile 16, and I was on target for one of my goals. And I'll talk about that because it's about my show today. Yep. Um, but then uh, my feet cramped. <laughs> and then we had to switch mindset and goal prep in my head of what was going to happen next. Now, cramps on a willpower situation. Um, it's not a determination situation. Cramps demand your attention. Well, they demand your attention, yeah. but they also take perseverance and some set of mindset abilities to be able to push through. And sometimes they can be so bad that you can't. Yeah. And then sometimes you can adjust. So, so at mile 16, I... I did not have my phone at the time. So I'll bring that story in in a second, Lou. <laughs> so I did not have my phone on me because I don't run with my phone on me. Not However, the biggest marathon. My fan. lovely, my <laughs> lovely husband, who usually is down working the finish line, et cetera, and, and working other stuff, um, was out on the course because I was needing services of like food items and other things. And at that juncture, thank God, and maybe it was mental that I knew it was coming, but nonetheless, um, he met me with my iced tea, with my watermelon, with all the stuff. And thank God, because I needed something else. I'd been doing other stuff all the way along. Yeah. Um, and I think at that point, I don't really remember exactly. He'd have a better recall of what I said. But I think it was something like, <laughs> I'm in trouble yeah. because I just started cramping. Um, and he's like, what are you going to do? Do you want your phone? Now, here I am 10 miles, 10.2 miles out. And I'm like, ah, should I take my phone? So I took my phone. Yeah. And on my phone, as a side <laughs> story, who's texting me in the middle of the marathon? It's Lou Blasi. Lou Blasi is talking to me about nothing having to do with marathon. Not like congratulations no. or no. good job today or have a great. Um, no. no. It's about, can, are you doing the show on Monday? <laughs> <laughs> well. And then all of a sudden you wrote, oh, you're doing the marathon. <laughs> you, it must have dawned on you at some point in there. Well, no, I texted you and then I got out of the text program and there was a little update, a headline about the marathon. I think at that point, the <laughs> leaders had finished. And I'm going, oh, she's running the marathon. <laughs> I felt bad. <laughs> uh, well, you did write back and say, but yeah. Um, so so anyway, at, at mile 17. And I wished you good luck too along the way. You what? In the second text, I wished. Yes, you did. Yes. When it dawned on you. Yes. yes. It, but it was just really funny to me. Like, <laughs> um, So at mile 17, so I had my phone. So at mile 17 and 18, which is the turn that goes up the hills to Heartbreak Hill. Mm -hmm. um, thank God for the charity teams. Big shout out to the charity teams who I run for. You know, the big umbrella mama of the, all of us who run under charity teams. So mm -hmm. like my foundation, everybody else, like Joe Andrewsy and the yep. Flutie Foundation, everybody. Their, their team tent was there, and Julia Syria, who's my teammate from New England Patriots, had made a special Kim bag of frozen orange slices. Not only did she make them frozen, but she peeled them for oh God, me. Really? Yeah. And I had a baggie of frozen oranges, and that at 18, mile 18, I think that was mile 18, it was up the first hill. Um, and, and, hi to Joe Andrewsy because he was there with his yep. wife at the same time. Um, we uh, That seemed to help relieve some of the issues I was having in my feet, but only for a very short time yeah. <laughs> because, you know, so what I figured is, so for people that are listening that don't really care about my story, but I'm going to tell it to you anyways, because my show and it's a matter of perseverance and motivation. Um, I think so. My my nutrition was great, which is one of the things I always worry about. Is like, oh, it's going to be this or that, you know. My nutrition was great. Hydration was great. I think what happened was I was, I think it oversalted. I have I take little salts, sticky things, um, and I think probably I oversalted, which then dehydrated me. So I was constantly bad. I think this is just yeah. my theory of the day when I'm going back and reflecting on all my patterns, I keep track of what did I do then and what I do then and why did it happen? The salting um, is cramp prevention, isn't it? Well, yes, but yeah. then you can get to the point where it can actually dehydrate you. So 
and I won't go into the fact that I definitely knew that because when I went to the bathroom, yeah, it was no longer the right color. <laughs> Not that you should all know this, but yeah. The, so that's uh, so, but I didn't know that until after the fact because, but I'm in theory going, why did that happen? Because nothing else was wrong, nothing else was going bad. I was on target for, I wasn't winning the race. I was doing something to keep. I had three goals. So let me go back to that for a second. But anyway, so by the time I got up, up over Heartbreak Hill. I'd sort of recouped a little bit of like my ability to compensate on my feet. So I was able to run the downhills, run some of the straightaways really slowly. Cause my, it was, I have a picture that someone sent me mm -hmm. um, and you can see like, I'm rolling a foot, like trying uh, to stay yeah. off the cramp part of it. You yep. can, I could see the, the, the run stride of like how I adjusted. Um, and then you could see in my time as I got closer, and I had more um, water and more, I was eating like watermelon and bananas and people were giving me stuff. It was rehydrating me, which is part of the theory of how I figured ah, I must have dehydrated through the salt sticks, stupid. Um, so yeah, I finally recouped at the end and was able to run the last mile in essentially almost the whole thing. Um, and it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing better than coming across the line to this beautiful medal that if you're not <laughs> watching, I'm showing the 125th medal of the Boston Marathon. Yeah, they spent um, some money this time. Huh? They spent some money this time. Uh, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's much bigger than usual. It's got like an open space. It's beautiful. It go right up on my Boston Marathon running wall. Um, in my room for my medals. Um, but it was it was a beautiful day. I have to say, uh, aside from the marathon itself, like usually it's in April, so it's yeah. usually stark and cold. And, and when I've run it the six times prior to this one, this is my seventh, it's been freezing, raining, snowing, sleeting. One of the years was the worst weather on record for 43 years. <laughs> so yeah. I've hit it all. But this weekend, um, God, it was gorgeous out there. I couldn't have asked for it. There was no rain for me. I know early in the morning it was a little drizzly, but there was no rain. It was a gorgeous day, um, warm yep. ish, but it wasn't warm in the very beginning. Uh, I hope the BAA does this again. We did a rolling start. Usually we're corralled off um, and we have to start at really specific start times. We didn't have to do that. We got to go off a little earlier. Mm -hmm. You just kind of get dropped off by the shuttles and you just get yourself ready, walk up to the line and go. Love that because it. Was, you hope they do October again? Or? Uh, no, no. Uh, they're going right back to April. Yeah. We're going right back at six months. So it's always traditionally been, you know. So not only did I get to do the virtual run for the history of this marathon in a pandemic, I also got to do a October Boston Marathon in a pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> The and April it will dates, go back to April. The April dates have been funny. I, at one point, it was a tradition for me to go to the Patriots Day game, the Red Sox Patriots Day game. Yes. And there was a certain point where I said, screw this. I am not going in this ballpark until June 1st until, <laughs> unless somebody's cutting me a check well, for it. Because the eight month, those, uh, those marathon days were brutal there was snow there was ice there was cold I, yes i am aware of this yeah. i ran one year in like eight feet of snow oh, so i know, I, know. <laughs> I remember i've been there i literally said to myself i'm not unless someone's cutting me a check i'm not going in this ballpark until june well, 1st. did you go to the and, game the other night after the marathon no well then you missed out because it was a beautiful night. It was absolutely gorgeous. I had a beautiful night at the beach, so I was fine. Well, fine, whatever. Yeah. Some I know because you didn't remember that I was running. <laughs> Feel the love, whatever. I don't, so I don't, I'm not a big me. fan of that. So I want it. Listen, especially since so I worked the, it. I'm <laughs> telling my story. Am, this sorry. is about my day. Yes. <laughs> it's about, and I, I'm going to get to the point of being persevering and stuff. Yeah. So, but the really cool thing is, if you didn't know this about Dave McGilvery is the race director for the Boston Marathon. Did you know that? Um, vaguely. You don't know that. You don't care. Okay. The, the name so, unless it's not, about. unless it's hockey, you don't know. So, so, ra so the race director who's been the race director for multiple decades, I think we're in 40 something years. Um, I think, um, he's run every year consistently and he goes out after everyone is almost in. So he goes out at, like when the last of the runners are really starting to come in during the middle of the day, late part of the day, mm -hmm. he goes out to Hopkinton and he starts. So he starts the morning really early by yep. getting everybody off the line. Then he does everything at the finish line. Then he goes back out with his group and he runs in um, every year. Mm -hmm. um, and so great guy, like such a, he's such a big support for all the VA charity teams and, and everybody running. And he's just a, um, he originally ran from 
you know, Oregon to Massachusetts back in the day. That's what his oh, really? originally, yeah. Um, and, and did a lot of the original like charity team funding. That's how it all started for years ago. Um, anyway, so he, um, I had finished dinner and came out of Atlantic Fish Company and was walking back to the car and he, he came in on his finish. So oh, I got the yeah. opportunity to go in and Dave's a great friend and um, wonderful um, human being and has done such great work for the city of Boston and the surrounding areas. So um, it was really cool. And uh, he was, I'm sure, tired. <laughs> so <laughs> long day for him, you know, yeah. for anyone to complain. Um, but that being said, my feet are still killing me. I have one that's swollen. Yeah. Um, under, like you can't see on the outside, but it's underneath. So I'm, I was walking a little slow this morning coming in, not because of anything else but my feet. Yeah, no, there wasn't um, the enthusiastic entrance today. I, I did do it. I sang. But, yes. Right. After you get here. After, right. Yeah. Um, so perseverance and motivation. People, you know, lots of questions came up about the psychology of marathons and sports and stuff like that over the weekend and if anyone was watching the marathon over the weekend there was a man that was first like almost the whole entire way he ended up not winning but he came out winning a huge lead um and he actually uses a sports psychologist um because he's a great he he touts himself as the greatest downhill runner and you know there's a lot of downhills but there's a lot of uphills so he comes out of the gate he came out so fast and now the one thing that i tell all my runners i had seven runners I had a, I, by the way, I had a runner who finished top five in the elite wow. this weekend. I can't say who it is, but nice. I can just say that. I gave enough span. Yeah. It wasn't number one, but it was two, three, four, or five. Just saying. Um, but, uh, and she did great, and I'm really proud of her. So, um, and she stuck in the, I'm just replaying it in my head because I'm so proud of her. And then I jumped from my guy. But so he came out of the gate. And the one thing you know about marathons is in general, don't come out of the gate fast because you get 25 and a half yeah. miles to go. But it's in, not a in, sprint. In, it's a marathon. It's a marathon. So in Boston, <laughs> the first two miles essentially is downhill. Mm -hmm. And it is the first, like the first half mile is downhill. And people just get so excited and come out of that gate super fast. And I have the first few years I did it. I got sucked into the adrenaline rush and did that. And um, but this year I did not, which is good. But the guy came out of the gate ripping, had a huge lead all the way through almost to the end and got up through the hills and got caught up with and of course passed, um, which, you know, he's got a great testament to his training. He's a great runner, obviously, you know, what a great pace that he had, but the perseverance it takes to then have to pull all that energy that he expended those first 20 some odd miles. Cause he made it to, you know, into the past heartbreak hill and he, you know, he made it to the end obviously, but he just had blown all of his energy. Yeah. So part of the thing I would imagine his sports psychologist was working on him with is how to contain, I hope it was, that contain that so that he would be able to sustain because he's been trying to win the Boston Marathon for a long time. He's from the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and and he didn't win, uh, you know, but he, God, he did great. I mean, he, he should have won, you know, if you could say right. he should have won. It was just, it, just the athleticism in him. Um, but aside from these elite runners, which everyone that's an elite runner has mental fortitude and toughness and grit sure. and perseverance. I love the stories back where I'm running the, the other, <laughs> you know, the other 20,000 people that aren't up in the, you know, the, the 35 person pack. Um, the amazing stories that happen and how um, people come in that are really great runners People come in who are good runners and people come in that are runners that are good because everyone's a good runner because they're doing a marathon. You know, if, yeah. you're, if you're complaining that someone's going slow or you're complaining that someone's not as good as someone up in front, they're doing a marathon yeah. and you're not. Right. <laughs> so, exactly. you know, there's a lot of importance about the fact that Monday morning quarterbacking from the couch talking about someone who's not doing as well as, you know, another. If you're not out there doing it, you yeah. don't have anything to say about this. And I'm big on making sure people understand that marathoning, even if you're walking, movement forward is towards the goal, you know, and people who have charity team raised or running for a cause, they're not just doing it because they got a bib because of money. Every single one of us who's running for a charity or for, we all have reasons and people that aren't running for charities who qualified by their time, they're also running usually for some reason. 
and there's a few people that are running for themselves solely because yep. this is like their pursuit and this is what they love and whatever. But then there's these people, our charity team's director calls it being overqualified. Not only are we all running for um, the marathon, but we're also running for a huge cause. And we ha usually have something near and dear to our heart that has to do with it, that drives us and motivates us. So I found out, I always find out all these great motivational stories over the weekend of what drives somebody and, um, you know, people that are at mile, you know, 11 that are struggling or people that are mile 22 and want to quit, Yeah. which, you know, you and I've seen it happen. I did not see that happen as much this year as I have in years past. There was such a great, um, the crowds were quite spectacular this year. Uh, I was very surprised. Um, people were really out there supporting the runners and across like right from Hopkinton all the way into Boston. Um, probably one of the best crowds I've ever seen in Boston at, at that hmm. at the turn coming yeah. onto Boylston. It was, you could hear it a mile and a half away, which you usually can, but it felt bigger this year. Maybe right. it's because of the pandemic. Um, and the mental toughness and fortitude that it takes to, bypass pain bypass what your body's telling you yeah. um all those things uh, you know is such a personal uh testament to each of the individuals doing it because you see all these people you know some people are like oh they're definitely a runner by look you know there's lots of judgments that go yeah. up there and whatever but then it's you get people out there that clearly look like you know wow they haven't really run a lot um, but they've trained, right? But they haven't really run a lot because they're struggling so much. And I ask people, put your judgment aside on the fact that people are, it, usually when you're seeing someone struggling, it's not at the beginning. It's at the middle of Heartbreak Hill, which is mile 21 or 2021. And it's four of those hills in a row. And you're now in the middle of 70 degree heat. He, yeah. Or on a good April day, you're in 45 and the wind is whipping at your face. And you're doing it, you're going, you're getting to the end. And the whole goal is you either have, I have all my clients do A goal, B goal, C goal. And now this is also in any sport, but in marathons, I always say you have to have an A goal or you know, your number one prime goal, your B goal or your C goal. Um, and most, of, most runners who do marathons have that for the most part. I mean, the elite runners do as well, but it, they right. usually follow a different little rubric. Um, but so, and they always change. So my goal this year was my A goal and B goal and C goal were very different. So people always, always say they're, and this is a big problem. A goal is time. No, I never do yeah. time on my A goal because <laughs> it sets yourself up. Right. Yeah. So you're, so my, my A goal. Cause you always seek the ideal time, the best time. Right. So, yeah. And then if you're, if you're falling behind your A goal gets squished. Right. And that undermines your determination. Once you, once you've lost, lost, once your A goal isn't within range, right. Your motivation and, suffers. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So in, in the cases from one, probably from experience from myself, but also just knowing athleticism and sports and, and running is my time goal is a D goal. So it's the one that's way back in the periphery. So my A goal is always to have fun. If really? you're just if yeah. you're out there and you're not winning the race and no one's going to be paying you at the end, you're out there to have fun. And people, you get, you get a lot of eye roll and scoff. But when you have people that really want to do a marathon and they want to do it well, usually they've had fun in some degree. Yeah. So my A goal this year was have fun. My B goal was to finish. And my seagull was to finish, period. So it was like fun, yep. finish, and then to finish, given that there was some latitude in there. My deagle was to do better than I did last year. So I didn't, but I didn't care because it was my last. That was like, right. I do mine in like a reverse order. So I had fun. I had great time. And I finished. And I finished not like did not finish. Like I didn't fall apart. I did, right? So. However, that's not to say that people always say, oh, you're so, you're so tough and you never, no, I know there was, there were a few moments because then I got to the Heartbreak Hill running company, which is right before you get over the edge and you're like on your way really into Boston at that point where I met up again with John and, and he's like, how you doing? I'm like, oh, <laughs> I had that moment because my feet, I just, it was, I can't even describe them, but I just said, I just 
and I stretched him out a little bit and I moved around and I said, nope, I'm like, I'm just going to keep going. I said, I'm going to walk, but I'm going to keep going. And yep. that's what I did. And I was in very good company. I have to tell you, I had lots of friends. <laughs> it was a lot of people yeah. walking because it just got warm and people were cramped. And I saw people like sitting and it just got really hot. And that's, you know, it's hard because marathons, if it's under 65 degrees, it's much easier, which is how the day started. And by the time, you know, three and a half, four hours in, which is where I was at at that point, you're at the top of the hill and it's brutal sun. I'm like, oh, man, this is rough. Yeah. So, um, but it has to do with, you know, having, it's not about like, oh, are you in the best shape, which I was in pretty good shape this year. Um, uh, you know, 900 days being from the last marathon that I did, <laughs> other than last year in the virtual, but really from being on the course to do the full marathon, 910 days. Wow. Yeah. 910 days. I trained for this marathon three times <laughs> to run this this way. And last year was better. My virtual was better. And when I did that nine loops around my neighborhood, yeah, right. But also it doesn't have the same atmosphere, right? You don't have the same hills. You don't have all the pressure of all the stuff around. You don't have all the adrenaline. It's, it's just, I went out for a run that day. Right. Right. And which is, you know, so when you put all those other factors in, all of a sudden it's a little bit different. Um, but it was such a great experience to go out and do that. And, and will I do it again in April? Yes, I will be hopefully doing it again for the New England Patriots. Um, but nonetheless, it's a motivational, psychological, um, mental toughness challenge. And man, I have, I've had some good stories this weekend of what people have overcome and one of my good friends um, was running pregnant and okay. another, yeah. another person of, in my life had dropped a significant amount of weight and had really run the training runs like to the letter and did like a 430 or 424. I mean, just a beautiful, like all these things. And it's not just, you know, people go, Oh, it's the time, but no one knows the stories behind right. all of the, the tears and the sweat and the effort and, what's gone on and people who run with pictures of parents and family members who've passed. And like, we all have a story. And sure. if you're not a marathoner, um, you may not understand that, but if you ever feel bad, I say this to a lot of people, like if you ever feel bad about life, go out and run a marathon or go out and watch a marathon. Cause it will bring back your um, hope and humanity because there's such uh love on the course for you know how you you love hockey players are so good at camaraderie yeah runners are good at camaraderie there's you know you see someone someone took a face plant when we were coming out of ashland coming down the hill and he like fell like four older gentlemen Ugh. like we all stopped to yeah. help him get up make sure he was okay you know that kind of thing i mean all along the way you know you ask people you motivate people you're like come on my girlfriend kelly was running and she was like yelling at me the whole time like <laughs> you just you know and i won't say what she yelled at me because <laughs> it would be on inappropriate on the air but nonetheless you know this is what we do first of all how pregnant was your friend at uh, seven good lord almost seven months huh good lord seven months uh -huh. wow yeah God. And then there's another girl in charity teams. I believe I can't remember how long, how far along she is, but she was running. She ran it too. And she was pregnant. Marathon is something we don't experience as people much anymore. It's a, it's a, a quest. Yes. Because it's not a one day event. It's not a single. It's not a single mindset. You no. have to do this. Is months of training. Right. So you have to have that mindset for a sustained period of time. You have to keep a goal in mind, right. and. Well, it's an accumulation of mindset over time of building confidence in your training and coming in, you know, like, you know, it's, it's essentially 20 weeks of training if you do a full training cycle. Right. right. So it's not like you go out and do a, a month of something and then just go play a game. You're 20 months going or 20 weeks going into running. And it's very specific of how to do the running training, um, which not everyone does perfectly. I was doing a great job up until. I had a, the, some tragic stuff happen this summer um, and things get in the way. So you adjust around and you make the best of it kind of thing. Everybody has that stuff. So it's not like a oop, one and done. It's a very long event. That's very emotional. That's got lots of yeah. things and moving parts to it. But you can't suck it up for one day or one mm -hmm. weekend. It's, like you said, it's a 20 week 
you know, endurance tests and right. endurance and perseverance. Mm -hmm. So it is obviously a physical goal. It's also a mental goal because right. it takes, it takes a certain uh, perseverance you know, to get through this. Keep moving forward is the, is the affirmation of, of my, like my practice when I had, I had seven people in it this weekend that I was, that I had coached into it. Right. It was just keep moving forward. Just keep moving forward. Just, it doesn't matter. Just keep moving forward. If all else fails in your head, there's, you can puke, you can <laughs> roll, you can crawl, you can cry. I think I might have done all those things. <laughs> but there's no quitting, right? Yeah. Unless there's something like really bad, there's no quitting. You just keep moving forward because the end will come. Yeah. And it's way better than walking off the course. Yeah. Because there's no, it's hard to explain that when you DNF, which is do not finish, um, when you DNF for anything other than something catastrophic on you, like, you know, overheating, dehydration, sure. like those things, that matters, right? Medical issues. But if you walk off just because you like gave up, which I've seen people do, the regret that I've seen afterwards for the DNF is it eats someone up. It's like I've, I've seen... You're oh, talking about doing it at 22 miles a side. Yeah. It's people, hard to I've, imagine. I've seen people walk away at 24 and a half miles. Oh, it's hard to imagine. And not finish. Imagine living with that. Right? Yeah. I've seen people, I've seen, I don't know them, but I've actually seen people drop like just shy of the finish line and, you know, been picked. This is where it's wonderful. People will pick them up to get them to go. And then for them to get to that finish line, I mean, I've seen people roll over the line at yeah. Boston. I've seen people crawl. So there's a video of them carrying a woman this time around. Right. But you have, so the thing is, them. just for people to know, like a fun fact about marathon or running, um, and there's some collegiate rules about certain things, and there's all these other things. You have to walk. You have to walk. You have to get yourself over the finish line on your own. You can't have assist. Mm -hmm. So. That's why they put her down in front of, if you saw that video of yeah. her, they put her down in front of it because in order for her time to count mm -hmm. for herself, she has to finish it on her own. So they can bring her to the line yeah. and then she has to walk over the mat herself. So, you know. That's good anyway, but yeah. It's it's unfortunate because there's some, yeah. been some really great athletic moments in history of runners helping people up over the line. Yeah. and. You know, or bypassing their own time for others because they help. That's where I say the running community is amazing because I've seen um, self such selflessness of like someone will be flying past someone and you know they're in the shoot for the top ten kind of thing, and the guy or the, they'll turn around and come back for the guy that's crawling. Yeah, it's just you know. Yeah. You, so you have seen criticism of people outside the marathon of people running because. Oh yeah. Oh. I, who does that? I mean, I, listen, oh, well, the stories I could tell you. I, I can't even imagine. I mean, one thing if you're a marathon runner, but is someone who runs a marathon, finishes a marathon, the Boston Marathon, hey, tip of the cap. I don't care. It's I, eight I, hours. In fact, I have almost more admiration for you if it's eight hours later or 10 hours later. Well, thank God that you have that admiration because I was a little slow this time. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I mean, that's double the perseverance. You know, put, you know, mentally going right. for four hours is different from mentally going for eight hours or right. nine hours. Well, that's why, you know, when I've talked about it before, you, you know, I always do, I do not ever answer what's your time. Yeah. And I don't do that just for myself. I do do that for myself, but I don't do it just for myself. I do that in honor of the fact that that is not the point. The point is it's a marathon. It's, there's a huge experience to it. It's not just going from point A to point B. There's more to it. And it's, I'll tell you about my experience. So like all of my friends and family around me are always trained now to ask like, what was your favorite part? Where, you know, what was something good about it? What was something funny about it? Like I will talk about any part of it and people, I have had criticism. People say, oh, you don't want to talk about your time because it wasn't very good. Um, my time was just fine. Thank you. I finished a marathon. Yeah. I finished the Boston marathon, the mother of all marathons. It's all good with me. Seven in a row, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so that's not it. It's like, I would rather tell you my story about like the guy in the red, white, and blue star spangled bathing suit with suspenders with the high knee socks with a bandana running with a tutu. I would rather <laughs> tell you about that man that I got to follow and trail for a couple of minutes and I couldn't unsee that whole thing. And he was captured on tons of things because he looked amazing. He sure. was really great. Yeah. <laughs> 
Because he was in like a speedo with suspenders, but and he, he looked amazing with a tutu. But no one cares who, no one literally, no one cares who won. No one no. cares about the professionals uh, no. with the Boston Marathon. That's been my experience mm -hmm. anyway. I mean, you you run it, be, you pay any attention to it at all because it's your neighbors and friends and people you know, and right. and you know the you know grocery store guy is is out running it, and right. you know the you know, 50 year old woman is out running it. And it's like, God, Well, the, and like the story is like, there was a man who had run it 41 years ago and he was back this weekend and he ran it with his daughter. It was her first Boston. She was 20 something. And he was, they imagine. ran it together. Yeah. Imagine that's it. like, yeah. in that story, I found out about that story from a police officer on Saturday when I was down at the expo was telling us about this great couple that he had met. And like, these are the stories of, you know, yeah. people who run aren't just out there, like they're not out there to win. They're out there because there's an amazing goal of like, this is an accomplishment. This is perseverance. This is mean something yeah. to them. Um, you know, women, I have the, a couple women runner friends that are out there on the course every year that are fast, 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 but they always have a reason to run it. Like there's someone who's passed or there's someone who's dealing with cancer or there's some kind of, yep. there's something else that's driving that out there. Guessing they seek that out too at times. You would? I'm guessing they seek that out at times too. That's yes. second motivation that. Yeah. You know, well, when you well, like, so that you have a lot go through your head when yeah. you're in a marathon, you know, from people, I can never run a marathon. I always say to people, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Cause I always said I would never run a marathon. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> then I did um, because I would be like, Oh, that's such a long way. But 13 miles is nothing. Once you've done it, it's like, it's like the next thing. When you have in your mind, a secondary motivation, you rock and roll between your goals in your head, like those A to D like my D, but your goals in your head, but also why are you doing it? Going back to one of the very first shows I ever did was what's your why. Yeah. And your why isn't to finish with a good time, your why is, you know, I've run for many years, always within my head, you know, like Kalila, my cat that passed people like, Oh, that's so stupid. Not to me. She was my, she was my child. She was my fur baby. Yep. She had cancer. It was terrible, but I do a lot of charity work around animals and animal work. And as you know, and big cat rescue and, and that's important to me. That motivates me to keep going. Yep. It, what motivates me is that in the New England Patriots foundation, we gave, 26 scholarships away totaling hundreds of thousands of dollars this last year um with the number one um prize of twenty six thousand dollars going to this foundation in brockton that is amazing run by this woman um and and her partners but for women and who need help getting out of like domestic violence situations and getting back into work and being provided for and a ministry out of attleboro who they help homeless veterans um, and provide 10,000 meals uh, to homeless people in the, that greater area of that whole, it just like, there's all these things that run through your head because you know that you're running and your support and you're raising money helps that. And that's why I'm big on having Dave here last week. He's a great athlete, but look at all the philanthropy that gives yeah. purpose to your life. If you're if you're dissatisfied at work and you're just kind of going through the motions and over and over and over, like go to work, you come home, you eat dinner, you do your kids' homework with them, whatever. There's other things out there to give you. You don't have to do what we're doing, but there's this stuff. There's always people who need help. There's always animals who need help. There's always causes that need something, and you can put. You don't have to run a marathon, but man, you can do some really cool stuff. And it gives you a sense of purpose and like, wow, this is really great giving back. And I am always of the mind to tell people, get your kids started in this early. There's a reason why college apps now require kids to have 200 hours of community service to go yeah. to college. They want to see that a person has exposure to selflessness and helping and that empathy and compassion and all the things I talk about in the show all the time about being your best self. This one type of sport embodies all of that and you don't have to be a marathoner to do that you just have to say okay how do i round up my life on that wellness wheel to make this you know feel good you know maybe it will cure a little bit of insomnia here or there and maybe it will cure a little bit of you know i ate too much or i drink too much or because you've got something else to channel your energy into that makes yep. you feel good about giving back without having you know someone have to pat you on the back you pat yourself on the back because look at all the work you're doing anyway so 
So that's finding your why. What about the perseverance part of it? What can we take on on day to day life? I mean, you talked in in the middle of that. It's about just keep going, and it's those baby steps. It's the day to day, just one foot in front of the other approach that you know so many people lack. It's it's what gets you through these things, especially the marathon of raising a child, or the marathon of a marriage, or the marathon of a you know whatever it is you're facing. Right. One foot in front of the other. Well, so, so that's, I mean, so it's such a great metaphor. I was just, and I was just talking to people over the weekend after the marathon and yesterday about this is that life is like a marathon and it's very cliche, but you, there's times where you persevere and you know that the, you know, that the end goal is worth the next mile. It's worth the next hill. It's worth, you know, the cramp in the foot or whatever, you know, metaphorically speaking, it's worth those things, even though they might be painful, they work themselves out. And eventually that end or that peak will come where you go, ha ha, you know, my, you know, my kid graduated or, you know, they got into medical school or I got the promotion or I went, you know, whatever it is, it's, it's getting through each of those milestones, even though there's bumps and bruises and stuff it's it eventually will work itself out and then there'll be more and that's i mean life is that journey and it and it kind of goes that way but if you get in the mindset for the long haul that it's not instant gratification and that's unfortunately one of the biggest problems i see now in in the trend in the past decade um people will be they'll blame millennials and it's but there's a mindset that started to happen of if it doesn't come to me quick i quit yeah, the concept of delay and gratification is, is old hat. People just right. no one no one falls into it anymore. Right, and with a lot of so, I don't blame social media, but I I definitely think that social media and misinformation and disinformation about how to live one's life gets purported to younger people, and then it gets lost on them that they have to put effort in and. Um, I think parenting has become more and more about pacification. Well, pacification so, is instant gratification. Yes. So I well, so it starts there. Yeah. But I always get you know the oh you're blaming parents. Well. So, but the, it does start at parenting, yeah. and so when you're, and this is this is, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a trend. I definitely see it more. Um, but the level of entitlement of you don't have to work hard for something. Um, if it doesn't come easy, you can quit. That is not an acceptable. So in sports psych, in my motivational stuff, in my client practice, I can say that if you come in with that attitude of like, I'm not trying, you don't last long in my practice, which isn't really common because most people who find me have found me through someone else that said, you got to go see because they have that fortitude and they want it. They just haven't tapped it or developed it. So um, people who lack the capacity, that's what I call it, lacking the capacity to move forward um, isn't because they really lack it. It's either they haven't developed it or they started to develop it and it got kind of bottled up and someone helped them by entitlement. You don't have to do that. Yeah. This is okay. This is mediocrity. Shoot for mediocrity. Yeah. Um, and and then some people will say, yeah, what's the problem with that? Well, nothing if that's what you're happy with, but that sort of sets you up to fail because mediocrity is not as stable as something more secure and certainly not on the other side of it, which is like, Oh, really tenuous and falling apart. So, you know, do we shoot for the middle? Sure. Shoot for the middle, but you can always shoot for higher. Um, When you lack goals and this is, we know this by science and I know this anecdotally as too, as well. If you shoot for, um, just being average, the likelihood is you're going to fall short because that's not a goal big enough to reach because right. what then, you know, kind of like what Dave and I were talking about last, last week. It's like, okay, uh, I got there. Now what? So you always have to have the next goal. Like I have a client uh, who did amazing this weekend on the marathon and she texted me and was like, okay, now I was laughing because I'm like, oh, this is, she had said to me prior, I'm good. One and done. I'm doing this and this is it. Hmm. Lo and behold. <laughs> and I kept saying, you're, you wait till you see as soon as you finish on, on Monday, they'll be, you'll be doing this again. No, I won't. No, I won't. <laughs> and she sent me a text saying, not only am I doing it, but I'm going to now qualify <laughs> <laughs> next time. And she was like, hold me to it. So I laugh because I just know 
the level of she doesn't shoot for mediocrity but i had to let her to find i said this will change after you run this marathon the the high that you get from the accomplishment of running it and finishing regardless of time even if she had done a 10 hour time sure. yep. she would still have done it again yep. because there's yeah. nothing like fin there's nothing like finishing a marathon because i've done marine corps and disney and chicago and but boston totally different and so yeah. when you put that into life terms for other people that haven't done a marathon in just life when you're putting something out there as a purposeful goal to get to and you um well people you've invested don't. time and effort and energy to get there and then you have this next thing and this next thing to look forward to it's just so motivating people don't live their lives that way though and one of the things about the marathons we've talked about athletics from a psychological standpoint is there's a quantifiable accomplishment Yes. Which you don't always get in life. You just get, right. the, you just, you wake up and you get the next set of challenges. It, it doesn't come a point where you, you get an award and okay, you've accomplished something and you go forward. So that's why, that's why on the day to day life things, I do gratitude. The at, so you do your five or your three, depending, three or five grateful things of the day. Now, if you go back to what Oprah used to talk about, right, people kind of roll their eyes, but I agree with Oprah because the way she looks at it and the way I look at it are very similar. It's not about, I'm, I'm grateful every day, you know, like prayers. I'm grateful that I woke up today. No, <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm happy or you don't have to use the word grateful. I'm, I'm so happy the sun was out today and I got to experience five or six minutes of it when I don't normally get to do that on a work day. Yeah. That means something. I'm, I have an intention for today that I'm going to make five people smile at the end of today. Guess what? I made 10 people smile today. It's looking at things yeah. that you typically don't and you take for granted that haven't counted. And at the end of the day, you go, wow, like I was present. I paid attention. I was present for myself. Things that are just like, you know, when I, when I teach someone like, okay, we're going to do two grateful things about today. Someone will say, I have nothing to be grateful for. I have nothing to be happy about or look forward to. And I'm like, how about that? Um, it's it, like raining. I'm like, it's raining out. It's like, it's refreshing. And they're like, well, that's stupid. <laughs> no, it's not stupid. And I have people say it's yeah. stupid. I hate the rain. Well, I hate the rain too because I hate running in it. But when I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh my God, you know what? My garden grew this summer like crazy because of it. And it's because, and people are like, you do this with your head. I'm like, but I didn't always do this. I shift it to go, it's raining. How's that a good thing? What's it doing for me in my life? And how's it going to benefit? Well, it made me have eggplant and tomatoes and all the stuff that I was able to sustain and not have to spend money on this summer. And I also got to give it out to people and make them happy. And I got beautiful pictures of like salads they made and all these things with the things I gave them. And people were like, oh, I didn't think of it like that. But it doesn't even have to be that deep. I remember yesterday just thinking, sitting on the deck and going, what a great October day. And you See? have 10 or 15 minutes of, of you just not dealing with every, everything right. else. You're just sitting there enjoying the day. You, yesterday was, was a gift. The last couple of days have been a gift for October. And right. Like, well, it's been beautiful. Not for yeah. running, but. <laughs> well, no, right. So yeah. that's why. So, so although I gave a complicated little pyramid there, I did that on purpose because that's the kind of thing you have to do with some people to get them to see that it's not just the surface level thing. Right. Like if someone, I'm thinking of several clients that I could say, go out and sit on the deck today and, and just let the sun hit you for a couple minutes. The answer I can tell you right now, be like, I don't have time. Yeah. Right. So, but when you give context for like, when you say, okay, if you sit down on the deck for two minutes and I want you to just spend that time smelling all the things you can smell and let me know about it. What you're doing is you're slowing it down because right. they're not saying I don't have time because they're now focused on, oh, I'll go out and smell something or I'll go out and notice something. It's deterring the brain from doing what it usually does, which is making an excuse and a justification for why you can, which is why you miss out, which well, the, is why you lack money. The people who are accusing you of making that stuff up in your head make up the I don't have time in my head mm -hmm. too, because you do have time. You're just, you're just prioritizing and focusing on the things that are drawing your attention. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Especially when for that five minutes, you probably can't do anything about any of them anyway. Right. So sit exactly. down for five minutes and take a cup of coffee and enjoy a great October day. But I'm guessing we talked about gratification and delaying gratification, which is important, but I'm guessing you use gratification as motiv motivation yes. during a marathon. And I, I think it's something we should all learn to do. It's just to stay away from the big goal. It's like, it's not um, 13 miles from the end of the marathon. It's like, I made this mile. 
Right. Well, so yeah. that's so when I and this is no no uh, secret I'm giving away in my in my training program, my mental training program for the marathon and, and running is that I have everyone chunk the marathon in parts. And when I do and I, I won't give all of it away because then no one needs to come see me and then it's free. But um, <laughs> every every person does it a little bit different. But I say you're going to break it up into something that works for you. It's eight 5Ks and a little extra th- and a little change at the end. And then I have a goal for each of the 5Ks. And I have people write it in Sharpie mm-hmm. on their arm. Oh. Like, so each way, so they're looking always as they're running, they can see what their next 5K is or their next mile. And I have people that do like a whole wristband of 26 miles. or So I have different strategies, but you take you take each piece, like I do it, in chunks a little differently and like the first six miles for me that doesn't even register like i remember it yeah but the way i do the goal in my mind like i remember things about it but it's the way i set the goal which i'm not going to talk about because it's mine but i I don't remember it because it doesn't count in my head because it's just it's it's like change that you throw away kind of thing yeah um it's mine it's a mind technique and game that you play with yourself to get to the 22 mile mark so you don't quit. <laughs> right, yeah. Right, so, but it's it's either mile by mile or step by step. The year that was so bad, was it 2018? The year that was 43 mile an hour per, per hour winds and it was, I have no shame in telling you that I think I started 25, 30 feet down the road and said, I'm gonna quit, I'm gonna quit. 30 I'm, feet was, in? Uh, people yeah. were crying. Yeah. People were crawling. By the time I got to Heartbreak Hill, people had sat down and were going the wrong way because they were hypothermic. Uh, talk about yeah. messing with your head, and I had and, and you couldn't lift your head up because it was pelting so hard with rain and snow and sleet. Um, it was free. That was the year that I ended up with an icicle in my shoe, and I didn't even know it at the end. And I <laughs> took my shoe off and it fell out of my sock. Wow! Right? Yeah. But I every mile, and I kid you not, was I. If I make the next mile and I'm not dead <laughs> for <laughs> hypothermic, yeah, um, I'll keep going. But it was mile by mile because I, I think I cried at the beginning a little bit. I was like, "Why am I doing this? This is not worth this. Why am I doing this?" And I was like, "Hell yeah, I'm doing this because what a story for my own self." And I haven't told. I mean, this is really the first time I've talked about it outside of like my friends and family. What a story for myself! Like I did that. I did that and no one can know. I was like, Oh yeah, it was a really bad day. No, you have no idea when you're not, when you're out in a blizzard and it's pelting you in the face with wind at you and you're trying to run and not freeze to death. Hmm. That's yeah. 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 <laughs> There's definitely something to be said for motivation and perseverance. But you can bring this day to day. We talk about the syndrome of, of you don't want to go to the gym. Well, just go do five minutes on the mm-hmm. treadmill and you end up doing your half an hour. You end up doing your hour anyway, right. because you just got to get there and make that first accomplishment. Right. Or for me, a lot of times it's X amount of calories on the treadmill and I'll get within a couple hundred and it's like, no, I'm not going home without killing that couple hundred, you know? Or you have, or well, yes. So it's always, well, those are the reasons and excuses that get in the way that are just as easy to replace with the why can you know I, I often get I have I have some I have some people in my life that will often say well I don't I can't do it without someone else. Yeah. You, what do you mean you can't do it without someone else? Well, you can't get outside and walk up and down your street. I can't do it. I, I'm self conscious. Okay. I mean self conscious of walking. Yeah. yeah. I can't do it because well because there's people that don't like to be alone, and think that if the, now. Seriously, and this is a serious thing, is like, I don't, not me, they say, I don't want to have people think that I have to do these things alone because they'll judge me. I mean, this is serious. This is their serious psyche that, like, they won't go to a movie by themselves, which I love doing. Yeah. <laughs> they oh, won't you go know to a the restaurant by themselves because they is. feel like someone will think, what a loser. Like, yeah. these are things, like, they get in a person's head. And and I, and for some people, I'll, it's, I think it's legitimate, like, yeah, that's guess. their worry. But also, it's also an excuse. But the like, dirty little secret is being alone for that period of time is the gift. Right. right? Exactly. Especially you if you thing. get comfortable with it and start to enjoy it and start to appreciate it for what it is. Not that. Not right. that I'm antisocial, I am, but right. it's not that I'm antisocial, but that time alone, you know, when you've got no one to account for or account to, to. Right. Is, is a freedom period of time. It's a great right. period of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Well, and there's such a benefit to uh, being an only child, <laughs> right? And only, yeah. um, it was, it's, it, you know, even though I lived with tons of girls in gymnastics pretty much all my life, so I wasn't only by birth, but I lived with people all my life. Yeah. Um, alone time is wonderful. <laughs> I when you, like to be alone. When you get it, when you figure that out, it is. It's it's terrific. Yeah. It's it's like you know the 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 standard is going to a restaurant alone. People won't do it. Mm -hmm. You know what? There's nothing wrong with it. In fact, it's kind of fun. Yeah. You know, it, once you get there and you're okay. Plus, you're okay. You're more okay for everybody else when you're okay with doing that. It's just it's an interesting thing. People avoid it like the plague, and it's a gift. It and it is, and well, and and you know, and aside from team sports or things like that, you know, utilizing the sport analogy around like getting into your own headspace and doing it for yourself. I mean, it's so important to have that alone time to really uh, modulate, moderate, get everything regulated in your brain to like really focus you because when you, here's the external, right? When you're with people, you're using it as distraction. And so to focus and funnel and concentrate it's like, you know, there's a reason why we don't take group tests. We take them by ourselves. There's yeah. a reason why there's a reason why we do things on our own to, you know, you, you, you don't take your driver's test with 17 people in the car because you have to whittle it down to be able to sit with yourself and to be able to do it, to yeah. think and concentrate and be present for yourself. Um, and I think that people don't do that enough, um, you know, and it's, and it's, you know, I, I'm sort of in the marathon mindset right now, obviously, but, you know, as I was running this weekend, another cool thing, the Chicago Marathon was this weekend as well. Oh. People ran the Chicago Marathon on Sunday, flew to Boston on Sunday night, and ran the Boston Marathon on Monday. Oh, that's nuts. Uh-huh. <laughs> right? Yeah. So on the course, there were two people that I was running. Well, I was running, and then this Can one woman. Can you physically do that? I, yes. They, yeah. they did. They were sporting both medals, and I watched. I personally watched it happen. But they... um. Um, but this one woman of the two, one woman was sort of ran up to me and she's like, Oh, she goes, I just ran Chicago. She was hurting. She was struggling. And, um, and as much as I wanted to run with her and help her, she was really, she was slowed way down Yeah. and it started, I could feel it starting to, because yep. of who I am as a person, I'm like, Oh, I'm going to be caretaking for this woman. And I had to do that whole mindset of take care of yourself, go away from her because she's going to pull you back and you have to be alone. Now, if someone else had come up to me, I was running faster and then I would have been, but that it's like knowing yourself to not fall into. Right. And that's like life. Don't fall into the rut of having someone pull you back and you can still love them. And I gave her lots of kudos. I'm like, good on you. You did Chicago. Don't worry. It's just keep walking. Yeah. Stop. She was trying to run. And she had a big brace on her knee at that point, and she was struggling. And I'm like, just walk. All you have to do is walk. You've already, you don't have to prove anything. So I was already out there, like doing this mental prep, going, I'm doing my energy on someone else, yep. <laughs> trying to like, you know, motivate. But it's it's that thing of like being alone in your own thoughts to keep yourself in check to make sure you get what you need to have accomplished, then helps other people. And more often in life, that works the other way. If you'd run into a, a marathon or setting a pace that you weren't intending to keep mm -hmm. you can run yourself out of the race that exactly way. yeah exactly and then and that's why you know you just like life don't come out of the gate too fast yeah because you burn yourself out you know and if you come out too slow then you get left behind you know it's i mean running metaphors i love them but you're setting your standards based on other people's experiences right. which is rarely works for individuals right and yeah. and you're not only are you setting you know in life don't don't set yourself up for other people's experiences and their training and their, you know, this is that social comparison thing is like, well, I want to be like blah, blah, blah. And my sister's you know, 26. She's got two kids and a big house. I should have that. Right. It's and so, not, and so use may any not be example, your pace. Yeah. Right. Like, Oh, well, it's not, it's not right that they have this because I, it, well, but you have this. Yeah. And if you want that, you know, I mean, I have clients that, you know, they're trying to get promoted at work and they, see other people who've gotten promoted and they think that they should get promoted just like them. And I'm like, and they'll, they'll tell me the stories, but like you can get promoted, but you're too busy worrying about how they got it and how they got there versus how are you going to do it? It doesn't matter if they right. got there the way they got there. What matters is how are you going to do it? Let's make a plan for it. But people get too caught up in, 
well, how did you do it? And then getting down on themselves were like, well, they knew someone, they're related to someone, their man, their, like all these excuses and, you know, yep. for female, yep. but it's always something. And then I'm saying, but that gets in the way of doing this, you know, and, and it's sometimes there, are, there are things that, that have to change sometimes for people in life situations that like, okay, you might have to switch a job. You might actually have to get rid of your spouse. Yep. You might have to get away from your in-laws because it's something's not working. That's making you get stuck. Now, I'm not saying run out and like disown your family and get a divorce, but, but all, I'm saying all too often those things are not working under the distractions. Well, and that's the thing is if yeah. it gets in the way, if you're, if you're having a, having a hard time functioning to the capacity that you know you can. Well, marriages, you, you're looking on Facebook and your friend is going to, you know, Cancun every other weekend. Right. Well, my marriage sinks because we don't go to Cancun. Cancun, that's right. not necessarily the case. Right, exactly. And, and that, God and knows what the per periphery of their marriage is that they're going to Cancun every other week. Right, exactly. And yeah. you don't know, well, I would say you don't know what they're running from. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, yeah. Right. Um, and, and I think, so I think that taking, you know, alone time and case by case, you know, your own self and not doing social comparison, but this is kind of human nature that people get into, like, I'm not as, I'm not as, yep. I'm not as, if only I could, if only I could. Well, and believe it or not, apparently you have people telling marathoners, criticizing marathoners yep. for running, which is unimaginable to me because it's such an admirable thing. And like I said, I almost admire the people I don't, I don't, I don't admire the elite athletes as much because they just do this. This is what they do. Well, right. Cause it comes so naturally. But the accountant who goes out and runs the marathon. Right. Yeah. God bless those people. Yeah. Right. Well, that's why I always, I, when I have had the, you know, I, because of what I do for a living, I have, I get lots of stories of like what people say to other people. And then I have my own stories too. <laughs> and, and I can personally testify to the fact that there are some runners who will even say, off color remarks about things. And if you don't have a good, tough foundation, then yeah. and not let it roll off and good self-esteem, which uh, several of my clients, they come in, you know, in tears. I know I'm going to get it this week. I'm going to have some tears for like somebody in their running community or someone that doesn't understand um, says something. Yeah. And I always tell them if it's someone that's not in the running community and says something, who cares? They don't understand. Right. It's just somebody being ignorant and doesn't matter. But within the running community, there's some strategies that I won't talk about online, but there's strategies that are really healthy to keep a person protected from people who are saying those things. Cause I've had people, and this is recent, I've had people who are no better runner than the next, if whatever that comparison point is, whatever, if you yep. just subjectively look at it. And they have run the Boston Marathon, for instance. They didn't post up any great time, but their social comparison is, oh, time. They didn't post up anything special, kind of just the average, you know, five hours and whatever, just kind of an average, you know, sure. totally whatever. But the person who posted up the 535 or the 540, it's just like, oh, they're so slow. Really? Yeah. Mm. They finished the marathon. Yeah. You know, and that for some people really eats at them, like it hurts them. And I'm always like, nah, -uh. it doesn't matter what they say. What matters is, did you finish? Did you have fun? What was your favorite memory? Like to reframe the whole thing, because that's actually what mattered. I mean, I have so many funny stories from this marathon. And, you know, the first 16 miles, I mean, I was running in the Holland and I got some funny things, people doing stuff on the side. <laughs> I mean, I had a bottle of, you know, Budweiser thrown to me, um, offered vodka shots. Nice. I didn't take any pizza yeah. was offered to me, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like there's all kinds of really cool stuff. That's like, Oh, that made the marathon. Like there's yeah. so many cool stories, but then there's people caught up in like, well, you only did it in five forty, or you only did it in four twenty. Really? Mm. But those are people building. I know this is hallmark psychology, but those are people building up their own self image yes. by diminishing other people. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Like you don't right. And, and I always, I always, and I don't I'll tell, take the extra self-esteem because I was five minutes faster than you. Well, people say, why would you want to go out and be on the course? Because I was out on the course for a really long time this time. And um, that, does, that doesn't, the timing of that doesn't phase me. It's until you bring it up, then it phases me kind of thing. But it's like, you don't know my story. Yeah. And, you know, and I've said to you before, and I think many times ago, I mentioned like, I can't tell you how many people run out there that have heart conditions. I have asthma I have like, you know, people yeah. have diabetes out on the course. And 
you don't know what's in anybody's personal story. You don't know what's going on for them. Like, how about just be happy for somebody and like go, wow, what a motivational story. And I think that's one of the best things about like being involved in sport. It gives you such a life lesson of whether you're in hockey or soccer or gymnastics or swimming, or if you are constantly moving forward towards a goal, you're learning such a life lesson skill of doesn't matter if you're losing or winning. It matters of what's your journey? How are you getting there? What's going on? What are the stories you can tell? I have seven years of doing just the Boston Marathon. I have 19, 20 years of doing gymnastics at a very high level, right? I have great stories. Yep. I, I don't, I, I won. That's irrelevant. I talk about my life journey stories of like what made me who I am today kind of thing. And that's what I try to encourage people like everything's an accumulation of your story everything's a marathon accumulation of a mile by a mile in your life how are you either succeeding from it learning from it changing it benefiting from whatever it is that's life and so i don't know i just think it's the marathon was a great life experience <laughs> for people and See, if you this, haven't gone out in marathon and you don't want to that's fine <laughs> this is an example of people who don't take their wins which is a, something right. that i find more and more uh, you know, someone will do something, they'll accomplish something. And it's like, well, in the long run, you know, they'll just think of, they'll come up with another problem that they have to deal with. Right. Like, okay. Take your win. Right. You know, sit down, enjoy the win and just, you know, enjoy it. You won one today. Or, right. You know, and people don't take their wins enough because they're so focused on the upcoming, what they think of the upcoming losses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And, and that's, and I think that that's a common I think that's always been, I mean, in all my years I've been alive, I think that's a common mindset, but I think it's gotten worse over time. And I don't know if that's because I've become an older adult now that I see it more, I look for it more, or I hear it more. But no, I because there are more people like you're talking about where you have a win and you feel good about something and maybe you post it on social media, but you're taking a win and someone else belittles it. Right, right, you know? right. Oh, you ran a marathon? You know, I've run nine. It's like, right, right. Take your win, you're right. You ran right. a marathon. God, you know, I have... So much admiration for these people. Well, and and there's so many, yeah, yes, yeah, right. Or or you know, even like a little kid who goes out and hits their first tee ball game. It's yeah, like, that's great. Or they hit the ball for the first time after ten times trying. It's like, yep. oh yes, you know, not like oh they suck. Well, they're five. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, and putting yeah. it back to like that five year old experience of like, but you do it with a kid. Like, oh, my yeah. kid's terrible. They're five. Yep. They're not supposed to know how you're supposed to be playing in the backyard, playing catch and, and showing them how like what? Yep. yep. Well, they're picking their nose on the field. Yes, exactly. They are the best nose picker on the field. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. You know, because but that's to your point is like take your wins. Like, so what yeah. the kids out there or they hit the ball for the first time. The kids not playing Call of Duty at home. He's out in the field hanging with his teammates and right. doing something and right. showing but up. They ran the wrong way, Lou. Yes. They got the goal in the wrong net. That's a story for life. Uh -huh. <laughs> you could torture them for life with that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that's a whole nother. <laughs> that's a whole nother thing. So anyway, so the takeaway from today, it for me, from from me to you and your life life daily pursuits is is like what you just said, you know, take your wins. Um, know that small, tangible goals, like chunking in a marathon mile by mile today, yep. next week, one month, you know, what's, what's today, what's next week, what's in a month, what's in six months, what's in a year, right? Because, you know, the smaller the goal, the easier to reach, the tighter the timeline, the easier to reach, the longer term, well, you're always going, but things shift and change. Right. And being able to, you know, like a, a marathon course, six months down the line is like my 16 miles. Oh, got to cramp, got to adjust. Mindset shift. Yep. Got to do something different instead of having it, you know, and I say metaphorically, the wheels fell off the bus because of my feet, but I had to then figure out how to make it work. That's right. what you have to do in life. You have to figure out, okay, you have this thing you have to do. It's a deadline. It's a goal. It's a meeting. It's a presentation. you got to still get there yep. somehow, figure it out. You know, so, um, but take your wins anyway. So I, I apparently just as a really quick thing, um, I had other things I was going to talk about today, but it got stuck on that. Um, We're back I will week. be coming to do the show with Ron as oh. a guest on Monday, I believe. Oh, you did decided that during the course well, of the Well, I think the timing is going to work out, but if it's not this Monday, it will be the next one. But I wanted to promote it so that people could listen to it because I'm going to be talking about, what am I talking about? 
Uh, Ghost Chronicles, uh, Monday at 11. I'm, I'm guessing Paranormal Psychology. So I will be discussing Paranormal Psychology on Monday the 18th at 11 a.m. Is that correct? Yes. 11 a.m. Find it on Ghost Chronicles uh, Morning Edition Facebook page. On the Ghost Chronicles Monday Morning Chronicles page. Or whatever you said. <laughs> Ghost Chronicles Morning Edition Facebook page. That's why you're the producer <laughs> and I'm the talent. Well, I couldn't keep track of the marathon. So. <laughs> um, so if you guys want to catch me next week one more time before and you want to hear me talk about the psychology of paranormal psychology and supernatural and apparitions and ghosts and all that stuff, I will be here to talk with Ron on his show. Yep. And if not, then have a great week. Go out and run your best mile today, whatever that may look like in metaphor land and um, have a great week you guys and thank you so much I'll see you next week